everyone, thank you very much for coming back uh, and joining us for our second panel. And this is, uh, it's like an in-conversation type of thing, but it's with Val McDermott, of all people. Um, and it's the title of the panel is, There's Only One Val McDermott, and there's a reason for that. But first, welcome to the Locked Up Festival, Val. That's great to be here. I'm looking forward to seeing your happy wee face. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we would have spent so much time together on stage at this point yeah. in time, usually. Um, but we've not been able to gig since February. We were in Paisley, I think it was, wasn't it? It was, yes. So it's been a yeah. while. It has. And it's, I mean, being in the band has really changed your life, hasn't it? I mean, it's opened your perspective on the world. It has. All, all sorts of things like Thai food. I've never had Thai food. And, and the band took me. We were in Ed Aberdeen. Aberdeen it was, wasn't it? And you yeah. all dragged me to a Thai restaurant. And then marvelled at the sight of a of a, a, a little fat scouser going like, what do I have? <laughs> I seem to recall you rang your wife at one point to say, "Will I like this?" <laughs> I did, I did because I I mean like literally my culinary palate was 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 Italian, English, and McDonald's, and that was about it. Yeah. Um, but we've uh, you've taken you've opened my eyes to new experiences, and yeah. I've been very grateful for that. So for the last six months, I've eaten rubbish um and i've been watching your shows on youtube which we'll, we'll talk about later yeah. um but first let's explain why this is called there's only one val mcdermott do you want to tell the story of why that is well it was the same night in aberdeen actually um we'd done a great gig at the lime tree in aberdeen absolutely packed lots and lots of people having a great time fun loving crime writers and it, it was weird because the, the, um, the, the bar's got a chalkboard with all the kind of people who've played there before and it was all things like Coldplay and rem and you know us um, but anyway we, we, we had a great gig and we were walking back down union street uh, about 11 o'clock at night uh, having a talk about what other songs we might add to the set and what, when we'd next get together and when we could rehearse. And suddenly this voice from over my shoulder uh, in, a, in a shop doorway shouted, It's Val McDermott! <laughs> and we turned round and there was a guy in camouflage trousers pishing in the doorway. And he was, he was continuing. Uh, it didn't stop in his flow. And he, stood, he said, It is you, it is you! And then launched into singing, One Val McDermott! There's only one Val McDermott. And it was the most bizarre moment of recognition I've ever had. You know, I'm kind of accustomed to people coming up to me on the bus or in shops and things, but that was a that was unusual. <laughs> I mean, that was when I knew that um I was uh, I was around, you know, different people than I usually am. It was that that moment where there was the, the guy pissing in the doorway and singing one there's only one Val McDermott. I was like Oh, Val, people know Val. <laughs> because by that point, we'd become just so close as a group that, like, it was, you know, it was just like, this is a group of mates just getting on stage. And yeah. I think that's what the, the, the fun loving crime writers became quite quickly, um, is that, you know, we, we forget that you have an extensive history now within the publishing industry as a, as a writer, that over 30 years, like, that, you know, has been built up. So, like, you know, I, I'm I'm gonna do this in a very much like a this is your life type of thing. Um, I haven't got a big red book. Or Who've you talked to? <laughs> I haven't talked to anyone. What I've done is something very very lazy. I've printed out your Wikipedia. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> that may not be entirely accurate. Uh, that's so, what we're gonna find out. Well, we'll for some out. considerable time. Um, you know, my, my, my partner, Joe Sharp, she's a professor of geography at St Andrews University. But there is also someone called Joe Sharp, who is a knitwear designer. <laughs> and for a while, my, my Wikipedia entry read, uh, Val McDermott is civilly partnered to Joe Sharp, a professor of geography and knitwear designer. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, like, her boss is going like, I didn't know you did that on the side. <laughs> And she does actually knit, doesn't she? Didn't she? Didn't she do some knitting anyway? No, it's no, you. I'm, I'm the knitter. I knit You're the knitter. I'm on, I'm, on, I'm on the second lockdown jumper at the moment. I, I mean, that, it is one of my great uh, hopes in life is that I one day get a Val knitted jumper. Well, play your cards right, darling. <laughs> so we're going to go we're gonna go through uh, your Wikipedia article and find out how much of it is true. But we're going to talk about what comes up in this in this thing. Um, so it says Val McDermott, F-R-S-E, F-R-S-L. That's true. 
Yes, that's true. And you were born 4th of June. Yes. I'll, le- I'll leave the year out because I've heard that. Oh, I'm, I'm not embarrassed about it. I was 65 this year. You're 65. You were 65 this year? Yeah. You should have had a big party. Oh, we couldn't have done it. It was only last month. Yeah. We were still in lockdown. Mm. We'll have to wait now until the 70th. But like... Uh, <laughs> 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 but that's, that's right. Is a Scottish crime writer. Are you a Scottish crime writer? I am, yes. Excellent. And you're best known for a series of suspense novels featuring Dr. Tony Hill. That's possible. I would say Dr. Tony Hill and De- Detective Chief Inspector Carol Jordan, because that's, that's they're not cool. just about Tony, they're about Carol as just as much as they are about Tony. Yeah, I mean, that would be my first thing, would be like, you've written the Karen Perry novels, you've written the uh, yeah. Brannigan novels, Lindsay Gordon, but the one that has been chosen to, to kind of lead this is the to- is Tony Hill. Everyday that, sexism. Uh, everyday sexism. So, bi- biography. McDermott comes from a working class family in Fife. So you tell us. So you tell us. You come from a working class family in Fife. So you're born in Fife. I was born in Fife. I was born in Kirkcaldy in the Fourth Park Maternity Hospital. Right. And your family. What was your What was your parents? What did they do? My dad worked in the shipyard when I was born, and later he ended up working for the town council. And my mum worked variously in offices and shops. Uh, both my granddads were miners in the, the great Fife tradition of um, manual work. So. Were you uh, an only child or do you have siblings? I was an only child. I was unintended um, or unexpected. Was, uh, both of my parents uh, had TB during the war and TB has a known significant impact on fertility. So I think they didn't expect to have kids at all. <laughs> and they'd been married for eight years before I came along. So either they'd not been having sex at all or, you know, they just got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, like, I come from a very large family, and we always said we just needed to keep buying televisions for the house, because obviously there just wasn't enough in the house to keep them occupied. Uh, <laughs> yeah. by, by, by child, like, eight, I was like, this is getting ridiculous now. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it kind of, it skips ahead to your college years here, but I want to know about primary school and, and, and first school. I mean, when you were four, five, six, when you first started going to school, what was the precocious child like Val at that point? What was you like? Um, I was just like any other five-year-old, six-year-old kid. I mean, you know, sort of playing games in the playground, climbing trees, getting told off for doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing. Um, I, I was I was a very quick reader, though. Um, our, our headmistress at Fair Isle Primary School uh, had a little group of four or five of us that she took aside to have reading special reading classes in her office. So we got to got to read more advanced books than the rest of the class were reading. So that was, I suppose, the only real sign of my uh, any precocity at that age. And did you have a local library? Yeah, there was a library on the other side of the council estate, uh, and my mum used my mum had taken me there from when I was really small, um, from when I was about like two two and a half three. She'd take me to the library and read me picture books. Because like a lot of uh, working class families of that generation, she understood that. The way for for me to have a better life, but to have better opportunities than, than they had, was through education. I mean, both my mum and my dad were really bright. They both should have gone to high school, but their families couldn't afford the uniforms, so they just went to the local junior high school and left school at fourteen. Uh, and it's a great story. My mum and dad's story. They, they met when my mum was fourteen and my dad was fifteen. Uh, she got a job in a news agent, which was in the next town to where she she lived, so she'd get the tram to to Kirkcaldy and uh, my dad was the shop where my dad got his paper in the morning and they went out uh, he asked her on a date they went out and that was the only person that either of them ever went out with wow yeah. that is an amazing that is amazing yeah. and, but, and even at that even at, when you were younger though they, they did they have a love of reading themselves or was that just something that they wanted to instill on you my mum was quite a reader. Um, my mum was always, you know, she was always had a book in the evening or she had the paper in the evening and she did the crossword every day. Uh, my dad was was very specific and targeted in his reading. He was a, a big fan of Robert Burns. So he read Burns's poetry and he also read, there was a series of novels by a guy called James Bark. The, the Wind That Shakes the Barley was the first of them. And he read all of those novels. So, so that was his, his passion and his interest was Burns. So he read them and reread them. You know how some people get about a particular author. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know that more than anyone. <laughs> that's why I've got fifty Stephen King novels on me. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's because they're so long that you know by the time you've reread one, you've forgotten what happened at the beginning. 
So that, that that was that was his great passion, and uh, that that uh, that sort of led us to I suppose I suppose a kind of cultural life. Uh, I, I, and I think um, that it, I think what you say about working class families that's very much true for me as well. Is that we had a, a library on our estate where where I would go every day and burn mm-hmm. through everything that they had on the shelves. Um, yeah. I was a massive fan of the Ina Blanton books, but it wasn't just the famous Five and Secret Seven. As you know, mm-hmm. I read the Mallory Towers. That was my, one of my yeah. favorite theories. Yeah. And it was mainly because I didn't really understand what a boarding school was. And I thought it was just this magical place where, like, you know, you could eat at 12 o'clock and it'd be great at midnight. Um, yeah. But what was your childhood kind of loves? What were your, your books that you were always reading as a child? Well, when I was six, we moved uh, to down the town and just across the road from the Central Library. So I had access to a much greater scope of, of uh children's reading but I just read everything there was I just read my way around the shelves um I basically would go to the library pretty much every night after school and change my library books uh you could take four books out at a time but two of them had to be non-fiction so I could easily romp through two novels in the course of an evening uh so I would read I read any like now the ones of hers I really liked were the the mystery series and um, the five find outers and dog yeah <laughs> um, and I reread them to my to my son when he was much smaller. I thought, God, these are really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> but I also I read. I mean, I read basically everything there was to read. But the the ones that uh, I think I I found, the ones that I took most from were the chalet school books, which is again the boarding school thing. And this was in Switzerland and, and Austria originally, um, and it was a, a sort of international school, I suppose. Uh, and I learned several things from that that shaped the course of my life. It was the first place where I understood that being a writer was a job you got paid money for. Because one of the characters grows up to become a writer, and in one book she gets a letter from her publisher, and it's got a check in it. And I thought, a check? You get paid for doing this? Oh, my God! I can tell lies. I can do this. <laughs> so that was, that was where I, I formed the, the desire to be a writer when I grew up. And I also, I think one of the key things about the Shelley School books is it was a genuine series in that it took place, it, there was a passage of time. So each book uh, covered a term or a year in the life of the school and events had consequences. So, you know, it's, it's like if you broke your leg in one book, you were still limping three books later, you know. Uh, and and so there was that sense of try, of, of wondering what was going to happen next, and of course because it was the library, you had no say over which book in the series you were going to read next. So it was like this giant three D jigsaw puzzle, and sometimes you'd be reading a book and you'd suddenly go, "Oh, that's why she behaves like that," and there'd be these sort of gradual dawnings. And and, and as I say, the sense of stories unwinding through time because she wrote them over, she wrote a lot of them over, over about fifty years. Um, there was a real sense that people would grow up and get jobs and go out into the world and get married and all, all those sort of those lives that, that flowed onwards. So I, I understood the compelling nature of series fiction, I suppose. I, I couldn't have put it in those terms when I was reading them, but I look back at it now and I see that's where I, I, I came to understand how a series really grips readers and how it works. And the other thing it did for me um, was it settled on where I was going to go to university. Yes. Because if you went to the Chalet School, there was three places you went on to further education. Uh, you either went to, to Oxford University or you went to the Sorbonne. And I knew my French wasn't good enough for that. Or you went to the Kensington School of Needlework. So obviously, I was going to have to go to Oxford. <laughs> Which you did. It says you studied English at St Hilda's College, Oxford, yeah. where she was the first student to be admitted from a Scottish state school. So this must have been, what, around 72, 73? Yeah, it was late 71. I did the entrance exam at the end of 71. And uh, I remember the, the, the principal at St Hilda's saying, we've never taken someone from a Scottish state school before. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, in the way that you do when you're 16, I said, well, it's about time you started. <laughs> so, I mean, that must have been a, a huge thing for your family as well, though, is that, of, the, of someone from the family. Was there many people from your family who had done that kind of thing before, gone into favourite education? No, um, one of my cousins had gone to university at that point, um, but that was it. And, and she'd gone to basically the local university, which was Edinburgh, and, and commuted on the train every day. 
Um, so, and, and, and I had another cousin who'd gone back later as a mature student and to Strathclyde University. But, um, the, I mean, I, I think sometimes I would catch members of my family looking at me at the corner of their eyes as to say, like, where did she come from? <laughs> and I've always thought it was a great blessing that I so resemble my dad's side of the family. <laughs> but there's no doubt where I came from. <laughs> and so, did you, did you, suffer any kind of, uh, of pushback against that there when you like go home like from Oxford to, or back up to Fife would there, would there be any kind of like who do you think you are type of moments Luca do you know you know me you think you, do you think anyone's going to take me on like that no, no but seriously, no, seriously quite... no, I think uh, <laughs> genuinely uh, I think uh, I think most people were just like um, I suppose pleased that someone from their town had done this. There was a sense of, you know, local pride, I suppose, about it. Um, and I certainly, I, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't feel that, that I got much in the way of negative response. I, I, I mean, I, I, I have to say that I found, my, my experience at Oxford was, was that it was not a place of, of social cliques and, and, and uh, uh, class distinction in the way that people think it is. And there's certainly, there are, there's particularly the, the men's colleges like, like, Christchurch and Maudlin, that are those, you know, we went to Eton together and we're going to stay together and the rest of you are all oiks. But in St Hilda's, I think most of the women's colleges, there wasn't that sort of atmosphere at all. There was really not much concern about what your, your background was, that what you were judged by was the quality of your argument, the quality of your discourse. Um, and and I, I felt entirely at home there. It was only years afterwards, as I was at a reunion one year, and one of my, my cohort said to me, she said, oh, we all thought you were so exotic. <laughs> <laughs> exotic? Me? I'm Fife. I mean, that, that, I mean, that is the kind of thing you do get, though, when you are entering, you know, a, a, a place where they haven't really experienced people with accents before. I think that's yeah. the thing. I think I was lucky as well because I was brought up, as I said to you, my dad was a big uh, Robert Burns fan and, and I was brought up in very much the, the, the ethos of a man's a man for all that, you know, the sense that I was as good as anybody else and if I had got there it was because I deserved to be there so there was no need to have a chip on my shoulder. Uh, I did encounter um, other people who had come from a working class background who felt deeply uncomfortable who did have that sort of sense of, um, well, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for the other shoot to drop on them to discover that I shouldn't really be here. But I never really felt that. I, because I had that, I came up there with that, that sense that I'd been, I'd been brought up to, that I had the right to be there because I'd earned my place. And did you know at that point that you wanted to be a writer? Yeah. Yeah. And was it always, that was always the singular focus that that was yeah. going to be your career? Yeah. Never wanted to be a train driver. <laughs> I mean, did you know what kind of writer do you wanted to be at that point, though? Did you know you wanted to write in a certain genre, or just was it was it just you wanted to use letters and that was it? Yeah, I mean, I think like like an awful lot of people in their teens, I wrote a lot of terrible teenage poetry and song lyrics and things. Um, and uh, but by the time I, I came through Oxford, I thought I don't. I, I realised that poetry was was way too much like hard work, and there was no money in it. You couldn't make a living being a poet, really. Um, and so I was, I was going to write. I was going to write novels. That's what I was going to write. Um, and um, because I had just done a degree in, in English language and literature from Oxford, I was going to write the great English novel, of course. So uh, I went off on my. I, I, I also understood that people like me didn't just get to be writers; that you had to have something to fall back on. So I had to have a day job. So uh, I became a journalist. Uh, I got a place on the trainee journalism scheme run by Mirror Group newspapers down in the West Country. And that was the day job, as it were. But even from the very beginning of that, I was determined that that was only ever going to be what I did until I could make a living earning fiction, writing fiction. And I wrote a terrible, truly terrible first novel. Um, I mean, the only thing I can say in its favour is that I actually finished it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> and I sent it to like I sent it to so many publishers in in London, and, and it just I mean it was like I mean it would practically come back by the turn of post saying like you know don't write to us again. <laughs> um, but it was I mean, um, but I did uh, show it to a friend of mine who's an actor, and and she said I, well I don't know about novels, but I think this would make a really good play. And so I thought, well, I know, I know how a play works. It's just got all the dialogue in it. So I just crossed out all the descriptive bits and, and left in the dialogue and wrote some extra scenes to cover what I crossed out and took it down to the local theatre. 
uh, and uh, gave it to the director there and, and he got very excited. He said, uh, I want to do a season of new plays in the studio theatre and this will be perfect. So at the age of 23, completely by accident, um, I was a professionally performed playwright. Um, on the back of that, I got an agent. Uh, I adapted the play for BBC Radio Drama wow. and uh, I got a commission for a second play. Now, bear in mind that this, this first uh, this book and this first play had been all about tortured human relationships and, and uh, the, the slow awakening of sexuality and about guilt and, and rage and, and pain and misery and you know, the kind of thing where somebody has to try and kill themselves in the second to last chapter. And I was then commissioned, the commission I got next was to write uh, a science fiction pantomime for children. <laughs> I <laughs> know it's crazy. I wrote this uh, this this mad pantomime called uh, "The Battle Beyond the Black Hole," um, where a creature had come over and taken over planet Earth, and there was no no music and no singing and no laughter and no jokes. And uh, part of the premise of this play was that at the beginning, um, the the two lead actors uh, would go would go into the audience as the audience was coming in and, and go up to little kids and say. See, where I come from, we're not allowed to tell jokes. We're not allowed to have any jokes. Do you know any jokes? So the little kids would tell them jokes. And this kind of backfired on us one Saturday in Scunthorpe at the matinee um, when this, this absolutely angelic little girl said, what do you get if you cross an ant and a hen? Oh, no, it's a flea and a hen. What do you get if you cross a flea and a hen? And the actress is going, I don't know, what do you get if you cross a flea and a hen? And this little girl smiles up sweetly at her and goes, an itchy cock. <laughs> it was like, oh God. <laughs> We're going to get run out of town. We're going to get run out of Scunthorpe on a rail. <laughs> so out of the mouths of babes. Yeah. <laughs> But if this happened like late seventies, early eighties, you were still working as a journalist. Your first yeah. novel wasn't until nineteen eighty-seven was yeah. released. So, yeah. was there at any point within those ten years that you thought maybe I won't be a novelist? Maybe I will just keep doing. I mean, sci-fi pantos. That would have been my. That would have been. I'm doing this forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, unfortunately, that was kind of the end of my, my theatre career at that point because I, I kept trying to write plays and, and uh, nobody wanted to perform them, mostly because they were shit, frankly. As I didn't know what I'd done right that first time, and right. I didn't know how to replicate it. And eventually, uh, my agent fired me. Uh, you know that letter you get. You know, dear Val McDermott, we're rationalising our list, and you're rationalised out the door. Uh, and uh, I thought, I, I still had this passionate desire to write. And I thought, I understood that where I'd failed in, in writing for the theatre was that I didn't know what I was doing. And I'd always read a lot of crime fiction. Alongside everything else, I'd always had a crime novel on the go. And so I thought, I do understand how a crime novel works. Maybe that's what I should be thinking about doing. And what really um, got me from thinking about doing it to actually put my head down and doing it was that Somebody I'd been at Oxford with sent me a copy of Sarah Paretsky's Indemnity Only, her first novel when it came out, and that just electrified me because here was here was a, a female protagonist who had a brain and a sense of humour, who had agency, and she, she didn't have to get the guys in whenever there was some heavy lifting needed to do. And you know, it wasn't like Miss Marple who had to get the police to come and sort it out. Um, yeah, Wachowski just went and did it, and uh, there was a kind of there was a sense of, of of a political consciousness in these books as well. Not not in any heavy-handed way, but an awareness of of social politics and a sense that the kind of crimes that happened in those books happened because of the kind of city Chicago was, the kind of, because of the jobs that people did, the lives they led. It, it had a sort of feeling of, of being organic. It wasn't just some random murder bolted onto St Mary Mead. And I loved that. And I thought maybe if I try really, really hard one day, I can write something like this. And so I sat down to write uh, the first Lindsay Gordon novel, which, you know, has this, this I suppose, the same kind of protagonist, you know, sort of a, a woman with agency and a brain and a sense of humour. But formally, it's quite like a classic uh, in, a golden age kind of mystery. It works with the same kind of mechanics as an Agatha Christie, because that's what I'd learned, I suppose, how to, put the murder plot together. So it's a kind of hybrid of, of, of that, of the golden age and, and, and the, the new wave of American women private eyes. 
and you wrote, and that came out in 1987. Um, yeah. But I seem to recall, isn't there another book in the 80s that, that, that you did release? Is there another one? Because it's not on here on your thingy. There was another Lindsay Gordon novel in the 80s, wasn't there? Yeah, it, 1989, Common Murder. Yeah. Is that, it just kind of, it, right, so that's one thing I'm going to have to correct on Wikipedia is that there is another. Yeah. <laughs> there, were, there, were, there were three because the, my original plan was to write a trilogy. Yeah. Um, and then I was going to write something different, a new write from the beginning. So uh, in 87, there was Report for Murder, 89, Common Murder, and then 91, Final Edition. And I thought that was going to be the end of Lindsay Gordon. And I, I actually sent her to live in America, so I wouldn't be tempted to write any more. Uh, and of course, as soon as I sent her off to America, I had this great idea for another Lindsay Gordon novel. Oh, that's so it goes. Yeah. But I always knew that I was going to write something different after those first three. Uh, and I suppose... Um, I, I, I get bored very easily. I've got a really low boredom threshold. I, I discovered very quickly after I started writing full time that I can't write two books back to back with the same character because I get like really fed up with them. Um, and so that's sort of sense of, uh, when I wrote the first three Lindsay Gordons, I still was working full time as a journalist. So I was doing lots of other writing and, and had lots of other different things to focus on. Uh, and so I, I, after the first three Lindsay Gordons, I, I set about writing um, the first Create Brannigan novel. I wanted to do something very different from my own experience. So Lindsay Gordon was Scottish, she's lesbian, she's a journalist. On the, on the surface, we had a lot in common, although in terms of personality, I think we're quite different. But um, I wanted to, to see if I could, I wanted to see if I could make a private eye novel work in the UK. Um, you know, because Raymond Chandler famously said, whenever he got stuck, he'd have a guy walk through the door with a gun. Now, even in the 1990s in Manchester, that didn't really work. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought, I need to see if I can make this work in, in, in the UK in the 1990s. And I started writing the Kate Brannigan novels, which were very different in tone. They were, they were first person. They had that sort of wisecracking uh, American sort of idiom to them, I suppose. Um, and as I say, I, I wrote the first, the first Brannigan and I started writing the second one. And... Um, my agent decided that, uh, and, and I decided that I, I needed to be published by a more mainstream publisher because I, I, although I was really proud of being published by the Women's Press, it was a small indie feminist publishing house. And you won't remember this because you probably weren't even born then, but in the 1980s, newspaper review columns didn't review paperbacks at all. And the Women's Press published paperback originals. So you know, my, first three, my first three novels were published to absolutely zero uh, acclaim. Uh, I, you know, I, I, it still amazes me that, that uh, I survived in terms of having a career because uh, when the first book came out, there was no advertising, there was no reviews, there was no nothing. It really was word of mouth and booksellers putting it into people's hands and saying, you should read this book, you'll enjoy it. Um, so by the time I wrote The Brannigans, things were looking up a bit and um, my, my agent thought that uh, we should be approaching a more mainstream commercial publisher. And um, we went to see Julia Wisdom, uh, and uh, her, her office at that point was just, was, was, I, I thought this was just marvellous, it was just like Dickens, it was the top floor of a, of a sort of house in Covent Garden, and we sort of had to weave our way up into the attics, and we're sitting in the, in the eaves of, of, of this, this, this old building. Um, and Julia made me an offer for the first two Brannigans, and I remember going home on the, the train that night, uh, and I should say at this point that uh, I was I was the, the Northern Bureau Chief of a national newspaper. I was on a good salary. I had a company car. Uh, I had a newspaper allowance. I had an expense account. Um, and I had a pension because at that point, Robert Maxwell had me thrown himself off the boat with all our money. But uh, I, I sat there on the train and I, I worked out on the back of an envelope that if, if I wrote two books a year, which I thought I probably could do if I wasn't working, I could pay my mortgage and feed myself. And I thought, I've got to do it. I've got to jump and I've got to jump off the high board. And so I went home and, and, and wrote my letter of resignation. And everybody thought I was completely mad, including my agent, Jane Gregory, who admits now that she lay awake at night thinking, how am I going to help her to survive? <laughs> um, and, and I thought, if I don't do this, I was 35 at that point. I thought, if I don't do this now, I'm going to hate myself when I'm 50. And I looked around at my colleagues and thought, I really don't want to be you when I'm 50. So I kind of came up with this five-year plan. I was going to write 10 books in five years. And if it worked, then that would be great. And if it didn't, I would go back to newspapers. Uh, that's it. And when do you, because like, I think people will, I mean, I'm going right off this now because I just, I think 
Do you think it was when the Tony Hill and Carol Jordan uh, novel, The Mermaid Singing, do you think that's when you knew this was going to be your career? Or do you think it was before that? Do you think, or, or after that even? I was bumping along okay. I mean, by, by the time I, at the time I, by the time I wrote Mermaid Singing, I was okay. I was, I was, I was making, just about making a living. Um, I'd start, but the first two years I was, I was a full-time writer uh, was a tax loss. Um, but the, the third year, things started to pick up, um, mostly because Jane sold my, my books in, in France and, and in Germany, Scandinavia and, and, and America. So I was starting to get sort of uh, more, more income from abroad as well. But yeah, The Mermaid Singing was the book that made the difference because it won the gold dagger. Uh, and that uh, catapulted me into a, a different sphere, if you like, in terms of what booksellers, how booksellers treated me. Um, and also we sold a lot more foreign rights off the back of that because often foreign publishers, they're dealing with, with unknown quantities, I suppose. And if, if you win a major award, then there's a sense that, okay, this must be an okay book. <laughs> um, so that was that was really the, the turning point for me. It was, uh, yeah, it, it, it made all the difference. And it also, it's been a kind of um, kind of talisman, a kind of touchstone for me that book because it was very different from anything I'd written before, and it was very different from anything else that was being written in the UK at the time. It's hard to imagine now, but you know, in 1994, 95, when I was writing that book, nobody in the UK was writing serial killer novels. And nobody was writing books about profilers in the UK. Um, and so um, when that came out, it was uh, quite trailblazing, I suppose. I mean, I, I didn't think of it in those terms. I thought, this is just a story that I want to tell, and I'm going to tell it, and I hope people are going to buy it. Um, but when it won the Gold Dagger, I said that was, that was um, transforming in terms of, of reputation. But it was also, for me, a transforming moment as a writer, because I understood that whatever story I wanted to tell, I would somehow find a voice, find a way to tell it. Uh, and still now when I sit down at the start of a book, uh, thinking, how am I going to do this? Can I do this? Oh God, is this, is this mountain too big to climb? I sit there and say, look, you, you did the moment singing with, with no track record of writing anything that different or that radical, and you just, you did it. So you can do anything, basically. And when you won the gold dagger for that book, was that a, a, a kind of recognition it was that you were, you know, you had made the right decision. Is that like, was that kind of that very apparent? Yeah, I guess, that, yeah, that was the moment where I thought I really can do this. Um, and it's not just me that thinks that, it's other people that think that. I mean, it's a real validation of the choices I've made. Um, yeah, I, I, it, it was a great moment all around. I mean, particularly since I had not expected to win at all. Um, I, you know, I have to say that at that point in the, the history of the, the Crime Writers Association, they used to have a gold dagger and a silver dagger. <laughs> so the silver dagger was sort of the second best book of the year. Um, but, but by and large, the, the gold dagger went to, I feel like, the older generation of well-established authors. And young upstarts like me uh, invariably got the silver dagger. So I thought if there was any chance that I was going to get anything, it might just be the silver dagger. So winning the gold dagger was, was extraordinary because it really genuinely had not crossed my mind that that was a possibility. Back in the mid nineties, I mean, like the, uh, now we have social media, which obviously means that we speak to more writers than we probably ever have. I know I came in when Twitter and Facebook. I came into being a writer when that was starting to kick off. But back in the mid nineties, who was you in touch with back then? I mean, who was? How did you correspond with people back then? Well, we had these strange things called chat rooms, <laughs> um, and. Uh, Oh, m much of it was sort of organised by your, your, whatever your internet provider was. So by the mid-1990s, certainly, I was uh, having regular chats with, with people like Laura Lipman and Harlan Coben. Um, I went to my first VoucherCon in 1994, uh, and I met quite a few people there. Um, that, that year, it was, it was a part of a longer trip around the States, and so I got to know much better. I got to know Sarah Paretsky much better. I got to know Sue Grafton. And as I say, writers like Harlan and, and Laura, we, we, all, we all kind of started round about the same time. And we've kind of come up together. Um, and Michael Connolly and Robert Craig and people like that. So, so Sarah Paretsky uh, became a friend at that point. Yeah. So, so the well, Sarah, Sarah, I, had a, I, had a, I had a great experience, uh, thanks to Sarah, very early on in my career. Um, I, I, I was living in Manchester in the 1990s, and uh, Robert Topping, 
was running Waterstones in Deansgate and they, he was doing a huge number of events pretty much every night. And he was, Sarah Poretsky was coming to Manchester to do an event for her new book. And so I, of course, was, was there in, in the audience. And, and Robert knew who I was because we'd, we'd done a, a little launch there for one of the, for the second Kate Brannigan, I think it was at that point. Um, and it was about 10 minutes before Sarah was due to go on stage. And, and Robert came sort of bustling through, through the room saying, he said, there's a problem, there's a problem. I've just had a phone call from the, the Penguin chauffeur and they're stuck on the M6. And they're at least at least forty five minutes away. Can you can you fill in? Can you do half an hour for me? <laughs> and so I got Sarah's audience. You know, there was like two hundred and fifty people there waiting to see Sarah Poretsky, and I got to go on and talk about my book and do a reading. And suddenly, I mean, I think I probably sold more books than Sarah that night because everybody had got her books already, but a lot of people in that room had never heard of me. Uh, so that was a great night, and, and that was the first really of, of me getting to know Sarah a bit. But uh, yeah, we got to know each other much better over the years. And did you tell Sarah at that point that it was reading her novel that kind of did influence you at the start of your career? Yeah, I, I said how important it had been. It was one of my many fangirl conversations at that point because I kept meeting people whose work I absolutely loved. So, you know, with Sarah, I remember the first time I met Ruth Rendell, I was completely pitiful. I was just like, <laughs> I love your books. I think you're wonderful. I think you're amazing. Uh, you really inspired me to write different characters. And, and I think you're fantastic. And she just kind of looked at me with that look that Ruth Rendell could give, you know. And I thought, I've got to say something. I've got to say something. And I said, but I suppose when you've written as many books as you have, it gets easier. And she looked at me as if I was really stupid and said, no, dear, it gets harder. <laughs> and I didn't really understand that at the time. I just stood there feeling stupid. Um, but I understand it now. That there's that sense if you challenge yourself, if you push yourself, if you if you're passionate about trying to get better, each book is 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 another is a struggle because you've got to make that sort of like incremental step forward. You've got to be able to look yourself in the eye at the end of it and say, I did something better there, or I did something different there, something I've not done before there. And so I have made a wee step forward. And it isn't always easy to see how you're going to do that or where that step's going to come. I actually asked you the same question. I remember uh, a couple of years back, it was the, uh, Chris's uh, birthday party. I said, tell me it gets easier. And you looked at me and you didn't make me feel, you didn't look at me with that kind of look of, uh, <laughs> you did look at me and go, I'm sorry, it doesn't. And, it, and, and it, you know what? At, at the time I thought, oh, that's great. I thought it would get easier. And then I thought, you know what? You don't want it to get easier, do you? Yeah. What would be, where, would be, where would the fun in that be? Where would, you know, what, would be, what would make you get up in the morning if it was just, oh yeah, I know how to do this. You know, just put one foot in front of the other, I know how to do this, yeah. That would be, that would be so dull. Uh, um, let's, let's go back to this. Uh, the McDermott stand has its own section. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, Val sponsors the McDermott stand in Starks Park, Rafe Rovers ground, ground in Kakali. This endeavour was in honour of her father, a scout for the club. Uh, a year after sponsoring the stand, she became a board member of the club and starting in 2014, her website became Rafe's shared sponsor. I've looked into doing this with Liverpool Football Club. It'll cost me a little bit more, I imagine, than what it does with Rafe Rovers. Yeah, I think so. You could, but if you really, want, you really wanted to, I mean, you could probably sponsor Rafe Rovers away shirt. <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably be able to afford that. <laughs> So, I mean, was football, obviously, with your, your father being a scout, I mean, that must have been a massive part of your life growing up as well. Yeah. Um, did, yeah. So, did, when Rafe Rovers, and I think they, they won the league, didn't they, this year? Or, or, yeah, yeah. I mean, is that, so, is that as much a part of your life as, as a lot of other things, or is it just like a kind of side project? No, it's, I mean, it's, it's something that, I, you know, we, we do um, take an active part in, you know, I mean, we, we get to the, when we can get to the games, when my, when my diary permits, we go, uh, and certainly every season we, we, we tend to do a hospitality day where we drag a bunch of our friends along, um, whether they want to come or not, uh, and make, we, once, we once took uh, Chris Brookmeyer uh, to uh, a game where we're playing St Mirren, which of course is his club. And uh, there, was, there was about, I think, about a dozen or more of us there, uh, and uh, we had a, we'd having a great time. And, and it, was, it, was, it was one of those rare seven goal thrillers, <laughs> where the lead swung from side to side. And, and poor Chris was you know, obviously sitting in the midst of all these Wraith Rovers fans, and every time his nerves scored, he was going to have to sit on his hands. And every time we scored, he was trying not to weep, you know. And it was, it was, it was, it was, I, felt, I felt kind of sorry for him, because, you know, it was, he was forced into 
not uh, proclaiming his allegiance from the rooftops. And we did win 4-3. <laughs> so we were all happy and Chris was kind of oh, well alright then <laughs> um, but I think I think um, if you've if you've grown up with, with an allegiance to a football club I mean it does become that becomes one of your tribes no, it becomes part of the place where you feel feel at home you know and when I go to Starks Park you know people people know who I am not because I'm, I'm a famous writer but because I'm Jim McDermott's lassie uh, and it was my dad, my dad signed a guy called Jim Baxter, who every Scottish person listening to this will know who Jim Baxter is. Um, I mean, Baxter was probably the greatest footballer Scotland's ever produced, uh, memorably in the 1967 game at Wembley where, where we beat England and therefore by default became the world champions. He was so uh, running rings around the English players to the degree that at one point he started playing keepy-uppy. <laughs> Nobody could get the ball off him. And so he was, he was, he was sort of, you know, that rare thing, a Scottish football hero. And so to, to, to Kirkcaldy, to people in Kirkcaldy, I'm still Jim McDermott's lassie. That's amazing, that. I love that. I love that. I mean, but, but, so is he a scout as well as being in the shipyards as well, though? Yeah, he, 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 he just did that part-time. He did it at the weekends. So he'd take me with him quite often uh, at the weekends and would would watch sort of shipyard workers and miners kicking seven bells out of each other on cinder pitches, you know. Um, he used to have a, a plank of wood in the car for uh, for the winter time to, to put by the side of the pitch so we wouldn't sink into the mud up to her ankles. Uh, and I think he just did it to get me out the road of my mum so she could get on with baking or cooking or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, it was, it, was our, it, was our, it was kind of our little thing. And occasionally he would take me to actually to see a proper game at Starks Park, um, but more often than not, it was on, on the scouting missions. Do you know when you go back to Starks Park and you see like the, the fact that there is a stand with, with that name on it? You know, does that mm. is that almost as much of a, 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 a amazing feeling as winning an award for a novel? Yeah, I think. I mean, I mean. It's, Certainly, when when, you, when it first went up there, it was, it was a real moment of pride um, to be part of something that, I mean, it, it's very much a community club. You know, Rafe Rovers, is, it's, it's the town, it's, it's part of the town. When the club's doing well, people have got a smile on their face, you know. Um, and I, I think I, I appreciate being part of that. And it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good feeling. It's a different feeling from uh, doing something off my own bat, in a way. But it's still something that, that you know, yeah, gives me a warm feeling. Yeah. Um, we've got to go to personal life, it says here now, Mark. It's a, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's, McDermott is a Ray Rover supporter. That's fine. We've done that. But she formerly lived in both Stockport and Northumberland with three cats and a Border Terrier dog. Mm. So how long ago was that? Because I don't think you've got pets now, do you? No, the three cats were the 1990s and the Border Terrier was the 2000s. I mean, they're going back a ways on this to make it oh, look. No, but everybody knows that Wikipedia has not really got much relationship to reality. <laughs> uh, in 2016, McDermott captained the team of crime writer challengers on the TV quiz Eggheads, beating the Eggheads and winning £14,000. Yeah. Now, that doesn't happen very often, and it, and it is a great story about mm. you being on Eggheads because it wasn't one of those celebrity Eggheads. No, it Why wasn't. And went on. Yeah, it was a proper regular Eggheads because quite often when you do these celebrity ones, they, they can be a wee bit easier than the regular ones. But we no, we just went for the regular one. It was, it was a good laugh. It was, <laughs> um, and, and I tell you, the Eggheads were, were, were extremely put out by being beaten by a bunch of crime writers. Um, so and, uh, it, was, it was fun. It was definitely fun. Yeah, uh, it was uh, it was Mark Mark Billingham was on on the team. It was Chris it was Chris Brookmeyer, Mark Mark Mighty, Mark Johnston. Oh, Johnston, yeah, and we had to, we were told we had to have a reserve in case one of us was taken ill. But we, we felt awkward about that because we thought we don't really we can't really ask any of our mates to say, "Will you be the reserve?" Because you're not good enough to be on the team. <laughs> so we said we said to to Joe, my my partner, I said, "Will you be the reserve? Because you just need to put your name on a sheet of paper." And she said, "Like I spent the entirety of the night before praying none of you were going to get sick." <laughs> <laughs> but she did all right out of it because the the rules of the competition say the reserve gets a, a, a share. So we all got you know we all got a sixth of the of the money. <laughs> so she got a sixth of the money just for sitting about, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's amazing. I mean, I think you don't know as well before you go on the show how much the prize money is up to as well. No, so, that's right. yeah. so you must have heard the about and gone like, oh, that's, that's a decent amount because usually on the BBC tea time ones, it's like 250 quid and that's all you're going to get. Yeah. But it obviously rolled over quite a lot. Um, but yeah. that was the, that. I mean, <laughs> I, I love watching eggheads just because they do look like the smuggest cra- uh, quiz team you've ever seen in your life. But uh, apparently, a couple of them are quite nice in real life. But I don't know. Yeah. What was yeah. your experience with them? Uh, they were very pleasant, <laughs> by and large. There was one, <laughs> but when we won, I, I was kept. I was kept back as the secret weapon. Um, and and I we, we won basically because I knew that the hump the humpback whales sing, and one member of their team was extremely sniffy with me. He said, "You've been watching all those David Attenborough <laughs> documentaries, haven't you? Just just learning things." I said, "No, I, I know that from folk singing in the 1960s." <laughs> so the humpback whale, and, and and this this particular individual looked at me as if I was just telling lies. <laughs> he just made that up. <laughs> Uh, it goes on to say, on the 23rd of October 2016, McDermott, who is gay, married Joe Sharp, a professor of geography at the University of Glasgow, and McDermott's partner of two years. So that was four years ago now? Yeah. That, I mean, I don't understand why that is there, but it is there. McDermott is a radical feminist and socialist. Mm-hmm. Not just a feminist, you're a radical one. It's I'm not to... sure how far I would say, I, I, would, I, would, I, I don't think many radical feminists would describe me as a radical feminist. <laughs> I'm a feminist and it, doesn't, it does inform my, my, my life as, as, we, as, as many things inform my life. You know, I, don't, I, I think the problem with labels is the labels we give ourselves and other people give us are, are only ever partial. They're only ever one aspect of ourselves. None of these things are exactly who you are, but they all add up to who you are. I mean, it does finish with that saying, McDermott has incorporated feminism into some of her novels. Now, I would argue that I think that <laughs> informs your incomplete oeuvre of novels, is that, that that's just your experience as being a woman, you know? Well, no, there's a couple of them where I'm obviously a right-wing misogynist fascist. <laughs> <laughs> but I write those under another name. Uh, it always amuses me, you know, that, that um, and, and this sounds particularly, I think, in crime fiction, is that, that I mean, all, all, I think, all crime fiction is political to one degree or another, because we write novels that are about social realism in a way. We, we, we are the novelists who, who describe the world as it is, the world that we live in, because by its very nature, our novels encompass a wide wide spectrum of, of society because you've got you've got the victims you've got the the witnesses you've got the cops you've got the media you've got all these potentials you can go from uh, someone who's homeless to someone in 10 downing street in the scope of the same novel without stretching at it and so uh, I, I think that whatever we write tends to be political but it only gets described as political if you are to the left of center nobody ever talks about uh, writers who are very much writing within uh, within the conventions, if you like, within what you'd call a broadly conservative tradition. Nobody ever calls their novels political. It's only if you say anything that butts up against the status quo that you're called a political writer. <laughs> That's very true. I, 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 I'm going to remember that one. Uh, you've got Now it's got a list of your works. It's got the Lindsay Gordon series. That was six novels over the course of 16 years. Yeah. That, the, the Lindsay Gordon trilogy became six. Game six. I was going to say, is that just two trilogies? Or, well, it can't be because there was no, no, quite a number of years between them. <laughs> six novels, really. Um, the Kate Brannigan series, which uh, started in 1992, ended in 1998. Uh, that, was fa- that was six novels again. Mm-hmm. And then there's the Tony Hill... Before you go on, I'll just say one thing about the Lindsay Gordons. Um, yeah. we've, we've, we've currently got a TV development uh, deal going on with the Lindsay Gordons. Um, and at the very first meeting we had, uh, they, they said with absolutely straight faces, of course, we'll be filming that as period drama. <laughs> it's my fucking life! <laughs> it's all going to be very exotic, is what they were saying. <laughs> exotic and period, yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I interrupted you. It's okay. Uh, the Tony Hill and Carol Jordan series, that's now in book 11, I think. No, yeah, yeah, book 11. Is, it came out last year, and that started in 1995. So this is the longest-running series that you've got going. 
Yeah. Um, why do you think that's different than the, the Kate Brannigan and Lindsay Gordon series? I don't know. I, um, I mean, I know why Lindsay and, and, and Kate Brannigan stopped. It was just because they stopped speaking to me, if you like. The stories that they could tell stopped being the stories that were uppermost in my imagination, uppermost in my head. Um, and I've always uh, adopted the principle of writing the book that excites me most. So in between the series novels, for example, there's quite a few standalones, four or five standalones, um, which were because I had a great idea for a novel that didn't fit any of the series characters. Uh, I think if you have just one series character, you really limit the stories you can tell. Um, and also, as I said earlier, I'd get bored with just you know, one series and, and one set of characters. I like to, to mix and match a bit, you know. Um, so uh, I think with, with Tony and Carol, it was partly, I think, a function of uh, but for the years we had the Wired and the Blood television series and I think because the television series was running that kind of always kept Tony and Carol towards the front of my mind uh, so I would I suppose that kind of provoked ideas in me that would work for Tony and Carol and so over the years um, I've, I've also over the years I've had lots of ideas that worked for those characters and for the jobs that they do so that's probably why there's been so many of those, but uh, I don't know when, if the next one will be. <laughs> uh, Car the Karen Perry series to finish off, that's the, the next novel from you is, is, is Still Life that comes out this year. Uh, when yeah. does that come out? August the 20th, I think. Um, and that's, that's closing in on, on, I mean, let's have a look, let's, let's count up. There's one, two, three, four, there. so there's, this is the sixth one. Yeah. Um, and she, I mean, like this one's been the most, you seem to be, you know, one year off, one year on, it's like with the Karen Pity. Yeah. Is she still speaking to you quite loudly? And is that still... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Her voice is still very much in my head. But I think there's a kind of problem. Well, certainly I feel it as a kind of problem at the moment. Um, because of the, the COVID crisis, I think it's very hard to write books that are broadly speaking set in the here and now. Mm. Because the here and now is, is, is changing on a, a daily basis. I've, I've no real interest in trying to write the, I don't know, lockdown, lock room novel, because um, I, I, I just have no interest in that. Um, and I, and I, feel that, I feel that I don't have enough of a grasp on what's going on, as I say, on a day-to-day -day basis, it changes so much. I don't know how to write a book that's set in those fast-moving circumstances. So um, the next thing I write will be going back in time. Not terribly far in time, still within my lifetime, which I suppose is kind of period drama. But, uh, <laughs> I've got an idea for a, a, a short sequence of books uh, that, uh, that will begin with uh, the novel set in 1979. I think, um, I think the, the lockdown novel will be written and will be written yeah. extensively. I have no desire to write it and no one I know seems to have any desire to write it. But I think there will be people who will be writing it and will, there will be people who want to read them. But I, I've had that kind of thing in my head of like wanting to go back. But I think I need to wait a few years before I can start going back. Because at my, my, this point, my period drama would be like early nineties, and I just, I don't I, I I disagree with the TV people. I don't think that's period drama just yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but it's cause I think it's interesting to go back. I mean, to look back at uh, a, a period when you were you were alive and you were you were growing up and. Um, think about the things that you were doing and uh, look at how the world is. My big, my big um, problem at the moment is I can't get into the National Library of Scotland to access their newspaper archives, but I'm sure that will be something that will be eased up quite soon. Uh, so we've got some questions in before we, before we end it. Um, we've got one from Louise Colvin who asks, who is your favourite character, Val? Of, of my own characters or of other people's I would characters? imagine it's your own. Um, that's a difficult one because my favourite character tends to be the one I'm writing at the moment because I'm kind of inhabiting their head. Uh, so, I'm, I, I, but I but I do have a sneaking fondness for for Karen Puri, but I also I'm also very fond of Carol Jordan. I think uh, I think Carol Jordan. I admire her tenacity and her absolute commitment to to justice, uh, which is something that that really drives her. Um, and I also think that before she got into the sort of, you know, like full on alcoholicness, she'd have been a good, good fun person to have a, go out and have a drink and a pizza with. But uh, I think these days, Karen Perry would be the one that'd be most fun to hang out with. Um, Andy Griffey asks, did being a journalist help or hinder Val's fictional writing style? 
I don't think it did very much either way for my writing style, but what it did teach me was not to be precious about writing, not to, to wait for the news to strike. Because you can't do that when you're a news reporter. You can't say to the news desk, oh, I don't feel like writing about the train crash tonight, I'll maybe do it tomorrow. You know, you have to write the news when it happens, and that teaches you that it doesn't matter what's going on in your own life or what's going on full stop, you can still knock out 1,500 words. There might not be the best 1,500 words you've ever written, but you can go back and make them better. So it got me into the, the habit of, of sitting down and writing because that's my job. Uh, Tracy, a.k.a. Mrs. Cav, she asks, as a journalist, Val, what was your biggest scoop of a story? Oh, my biggest scoop? Well, I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't necessarily say it was the biggest scoop, but it was the most high-pressure uh, story that I ever did. It was uh, the night in 1978 when, 78, it's when the second Pope died. Because the first Pope had died, the Pope had died about a month before, uh, and they got, you know, I got, they got another Pope, and then he died. And it happened in the evening, uh, and the, the office was almost deserted. I was on the night shift, and my, the night news editor was, as was usually the way, he was on his break in the pub. Uh, and the other night shift reporter was also on his break in the pub. Uh, <laughs> and the, the back bench, the, the, the deputy editor was screaming for a new front page and a new centrefold, new, a new spread across the centre. And it was just before first edition time, so there was like, like no time at all. So I rang the pub to get the night news editor to come back. And he just said, don't take the piss, that happened a month ago, and put the phone down on me. And I was just like, ah! Oh! <laughs> so there was one other reporter still left in the office, so she went down to the library to get the cuttings. And I got her to, to, to knock up a piece on the cuttings. I phoned the Archbishop of Glasgow, meanwhile sort of typing with the other hand to get this story. And, and I'm against the clock, we rewrote the front page, we rewrote the center spread, and got the first edition away just a few minutes late. So eventually the, the news editor comes back from the pub and he picks up, casually picks the paper up as he's going past. And he goes like, what the fuck? The Pope's dead. How did you not get me back from the pub? <laughs> <laughs> so that was, just, that was probably the most pressured job I ever had. <laughs> uh, and finally, uh, we're going to end on quickly. Uh, Alex Hawley, who's asked, when doing the YouTube cooking show, have you ever conferred with Will Dean about the Thai food? But I, I mean, but no, the, the cooking show, this is what I, this is, I, I would have done an hour on the cooking show. <laughs> me, uh, me, Emma and the kids have adored this, this series. This is our, this is our favourite thing to watch in the last like couple of months. Oh, that's nice of you to say that. We loved it. Absolutely loved it. it apart from when you're chopping stuff and we worry about you're going about to hit, you know, chop off a finger. Um, but it, it, it's absolutely brilliant. What, what gave you the, I mean, like what gave you the idea to do a cooking show of all things? During lockdown, well, it just we wanted to, I wanted to do something different. It wasn't just sort of talking head, talking about my books and and, and doing that kind of thing. Um, and quite a lot of people have, have commented over the years about about things I've written about in the books that people have been eating or whatever, um, and saying how do you make that? How do you cook that? Um, and it's kind of came to a head with um, with uh, Karen Perry's stovies, lentil stovies, a couple of books back. And the various people were saying, oh, I tried to make the stovies the way you described it in the book. They're really nice. And then my son started making it, and my godson started making it. And I sort of thought, well, this, this, you know, this is maybe a different way of, of talking about the books, is to do it through, you know, here's the food that they're eating. And so we thought we'd have a go at it. Uh, and uh, it, I don't know, it just, Joe developed hitherto unsuspected skills as a, a videographer uh, and a straight man, as it were. <laughs> so uh, we, 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 we kind of, we, we did one or two, and then people seemed to like them, and, and so we did some more. And we, we did eight of them all together, uh, cooking the books, Adventures in the Fiction Kitchen. Uh, and we thought we'd stop while we were ahead. <laughs> um, but we have said that we'll probably come back and do specials, one yeah. of festive ones or something like that. You know. <laughs> and finally, finally. We'll do a, might do a clutty dumpling, you know, exotic Scottish things. <laughs> uh, finally, finally, though, because there was something I really did want to mention, uh, it's because it's, it's this Sunday. It was your involvement with the Homeless World Cup. Uh, yes. You put together an anthology of stories, which is now available to pre-order on Amazon, I believe. Yes. And that's called... Home Fixtures. Um, it's a, a collection of tw 24 authors have contributed pieces, mostly short stories, some poems, about either football or homelessness, or indeed a mashup of football and homelessness. The Homeless World Cup is a, a tremendous uh, organisation. Every year they have a tournament, and this brings together 
homeless people in teams from all around the world and it's had to be cancelled this year because of the virus and but we want to we need to raise funds for the organization to continue this is something that changes lives um people come back from this they, they, they go on to have careers in football or, or not in football, but it gives them a sense of responsibility, a sense of self-respect, a sense of being part of something. Um, I think the homelessness problem is only going to get worse in this country and, and all around the world as an aftermath of the virus. So many people losing their jobs, losing their homes, losing their incomes. Um, and it, it behoves us to, to be supportive of people when they're you know, when their lives have not gone according to plan. I think uh, we live in rich societies, particularly here in, in, in the West, and it's, it's absurd that we live in one of the richest countries in the world and there are people who don't have a roof over their head. So that's what this is about. But it's a great read. Home Fixtures, one ninety nine. You can order it on Kindle, but you can read it on any of your appliances that gets a Kindle app on it. Uh, and there's a great story. It's a really good read. I've got, I've got, I've pre-ordered my copy. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm in it as well, which is nice. Thank you for asking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, um, that, that's an amazing thing to do. And there is, there is, will be things happening on Sunday as well, and you can find out. Yes, there's that. a whole, a whole day of programming. There'll be, there'll be some highlights from previous games in a kind of match of the day kind of format. And there'll be the, 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 the finals of the Keepy Uppy Championship. Uh, and then uh, uh, there's a thing called Extra Time, which is going to be. Um, economists, entrepreneurs, politicians talking about how we end homelessness in the world and that kicks off with Nicola Sturgeon in discussion with Michael Sheen who's one of the Homeless World Cup ambassadors. It's a great deal, a great day of, of, of programming and fun um, and, and it's also some of the extraordinary stories of, of people who have come to the Homeless World Cup as players and it's transformed their lives. That's amazing. Well Val, thank you so much for the past hour. Um, it was lovely finding out what was true on your Wikipedia article and what was not. <laughs> I've loved hearing the stories of your life, as I always do. I can't wait to see it again in the flesh yeah. uh, and get a proper hug. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, and thanks, everyone, for watching. Uh, we'll be back at half six with the confessions panel, which should be quite fun. Uh, but for now, Val, thank you so much. Go and buy the uh, Home Fixtures uh, anthology. Make sure you pre-order Still Life comes out in August uh, and thank you so much Val you've been an absolute joy and a pleasure as always can't wait to see you love you thanks Luca. love you too